Uh, can I have the speakers from the next panel up? Uh, Jonathan Cote and Jack Froth. So I'm also a last minute call up for this uh, moderation. So I'm gonna keep this short too. Um, Jack Froze is the uh, mayor of the township of Langley. This is his second term. Uh, and Jonathan Cote uh, served three terms on the new Westminster City Council before being elected as mayor. And we've heard a bit about his background, so we don't need to hear that again. Uh, and so they're going to talk right now about what it's like to work within the regional system. And so I think that you kind of have a sense of what you need to say. And uh, I have a, potentially a couple of questions, but we'll mostly open it up to the floor after you speak. OK. Thank you. It's your home. You, okay. you're, we're in your hometown. You start. OK, well, is this on? Can everyone hear me? OK. Well, it's, uh, it's glad, to be, uh, glad to be here uh, to, to be able to talk about regionalism. Uh, in a typical politician form, I'm going to probably try and answer the question I want to answer as opposed to the one that was, was actually posed to me. But uh, I, I want to focus on you know, what's, what's working in regionalism, in my opinion, in our region, and, and what's, what's not. Uh, uh, you know, I think back, uh, way back to, to my youth when, uh, when I was a student at SFU uh, learning about, uh, about urban studies. And the, the discussions we'd often have, uh, the theoretical discussions about governance and, and all the different models we can, we can look at. And certainly very interesting uh, conversations, but I think sometimes what was lacking those conversations is you have to know, you know, if you're going to be talking about changes, there's got to be a reason why. Something has to not be working. And I think in many respects, when I look at regionalism in Metro Vancouver, there are a lot of things that that are working, and there are certainly some things that, that are not. So uh, I thought I would spend my opening time kind of talking a little bit, uh, a little bit about uh, my thoughts on, on kind of what's working. Uh, in terms of Metro Vancouver, um, when it comes to their role in, in regionalism in the area, uh, they have a lot of core responsibilities, which I, I think they do very, very well. Uh, you know, whether I, you know, I'm pouring a tap, uh, tap of water at, at my home, uh, or dealing with our sewage system or, or our waste system. Uh, in many respects, uh, you know, Metro Vancouver very competently uh, is, has been able to manage that for, for many decades in our, in our region. So, you know, when we kind of think about changing regionalism or where the opportunities are, you know, to me, it's, there's, there's no point in, uh, you know, reinventing things that, that aren't necessarily broken. And, um, you know, I think of some of the key uh, successes we've had in regionalism uh, over over the past many many decades, and uh, you know, a big part has been you know where the region has come in terms of regional planning. And you know, I think Gord's uh, comments kind of really highlight that that's something that's going to be an ongoing battle, and it's something we need to to continue to defend. But I think we need to recognize we've had some huge successes in the development of our Leavable region. Like I'm often fascinated when I look at maps that were created in the 60s and 70s as to their future vision for the region. And although it hasn't been a perfect match, uh, for the most part, how the region has developed over that time has been very much consistent to, to some of those core principles that were established uh, four, four decades ago. And I think it's important to recognize the, the systems and the regional government structures that were in place that allowed, uh, allowed that to, to happen uh, there. Uh, you know, I think another major success uh, in, in, in the Metro Vancouver region has, has also been in, in terms of our waste reduction. Uh, you know, the Vancouver area really is a leader when it has, has come to how we've dealt with, uh, with waste to things. And in many respects, cities all across North America, when they're looking at uh, advancing in waste reduction, they're, they're looking at Vancouver, how we've been able to, to seamlessly put in organic waste, how in most municipalities in Metro Vancouver, garbage pickup is every other week instead of every week. Uh, we just take a lot of these things for, for granted, but the reality is, no, we're, we're actually, in many respects, uh, leading you know, leaders in that regard. So I've, I've kind of touched on some of the positives, and now I guess I'm going to, to switch gears to where I would say the three areas where regionalism is failing in the Metro Vancouver area and where we need, in my opinion, to, to be focusing a lot of attention on how can we start to do things differently to, to lead to some successes. Um, the first one is transportation. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges we've, we've had in our region for a long time is 
we have failed to fully connect transportation planning with our, our regional regional planning in uh, in in this region. And I think we're starting to see see those those cleavages and and starting to see how that disconnect is is causing some challenges. Um, the current structure with, uh, with with TransLink is, you know, I, I think it's it's messy at at, at best, and uh, you know, I, I don't mean any disrespect to uh, to the board members that, that currently serve on on the TransLink board, um, but the big challenge is when you've got a region where transportation is such a big issue, a hot topic of of confrontation in this region, and so many people are frustrated, but the problem is no one knows who's responsible. If you were to go out onto the street uh, and find someone angry about transportation, and I guarantee that wouldn't be a very hard task to, to, to accomplish, you would be dealing with individuals that would, some would point fingers at the mayors, some would point fingers at, uh, at the province, some would point fingers at this thing called TransLink, which no one really understands for the most part what that is. And that diffusion of accountability, I think, has actually created the situation that we have right now. Um, and you've also got a TransLink organization, which I think they don't know who their master is, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think that is causing, causing issues. Uh, you know, the mayors quite often will come out with pronouncements or things in terms of what we would like to see the future for transportation. Well, then the province will say the exact opposite. And then, then you have the TransLink board there as well, putting in a third point of view. And the reality is I think you've got a confused organization that actually uh, is, is lacking that focus as to what direction do we really need to be going in. And I think that kind of leads to my final point on transportation is really the nub of the biggest problems we have here is that local governments and their vision for transportation in our region does not align with the provincial government's region for transportation in the region. Um, you know, I, I really love the, the question from the student uh, to Minister Fassbender who, uh, regarding how does the Massey Bridge fit into the context of 40 years of planning in the region. And um, unfortunately, I didn't quite catch the, the clear answer out of uh, what, what that was uh, in, in, in the minister's response. But I think it's something we need to actually be perfectly upfront about in the region here, um, because it's, it's really frustrating as, uh, you know, as a local mayor who continues to want to, uh, to support the livable region strategy um, and, and everything involved with that, including uh, the mayor's transportation plan, and then having a completely different vision for, for transportation. And you know, the problem is I don't think we're ever gonna be able to that step forward until we can both, the, both the provincial government and local governments can be singing off the same, uh, same strong sheet. Um, I, earlier when I was talking about, I talked about some of the successes in, in Denver and, and how they have suddenly, over the last 10 years, started to see rapid expansion in, in, in public transit. And it was really where that came from was local governments all coming together and state governments actually all starting to recognize if you know if we don't have a common vision we're actually going to be underperforming the region and right now i don't see that clear path forward but uh, you know i'd say if i were to identify the top threat to this region uh, that's it right there the second one i wanted to talk about uh, is is housing and uh, you know, I think this is an issue you read about in the papers quite quite regularly about the challenges with affordable housing in the in in the Metro Vancouver region. Um, I think where where we've kind of we, we've lost an opportunity with our regional government to to play, I think, a, a much stronger role is as part of that solution. Um, many people are, are unaware that uh, Metro Vancouver has a housing corporation that houses about. 11,000 people uh, in, in the region in various different municipalities across, uh, across Metro Vancouver. Um, the problem is there was 30 years ago, there was the same amount of units. There hasn't been any, uh, any invigoration or any uh, political will to actually see, uh, see Metro Vancouver take a model, which I say is an incredible model for affordable housing in the region and not expand it. There isn't any local money being put into it. It's basically a self-funding affordable housing system, which is doing very fine for itself. But in my opinion, I think the region should be setting much higher aspirations. Now, there's no doubt, uh, you know, it's been disappointing to see provincial and federal governments get out of the housing discussion for, for many decades. Um, and I'm hopeful with the, with the new federal government that that landscape will start to change. Um, but I've often found Local governments and regional local governments have used provincial and federal stepping back on housing as just, you know, their affordable housing strategies have essentially been pointing fingers at other levels of government instead of actually recognizing that the tools that they have. 
Now, I currently serve on the Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation board, and you know how I got there was a bit bit puzzling. And I think if we really want to study some challenges with governance, I think that's probably a pretty good example. Uh, how I got there was uh, after getting elected mayor, um, I, I had a discussion with Greg Moore, the chair of Metro Vancouver, and uh, him and the vice chair have a talk to basically distribute the different committees. And uh, I had expressed an interest in, in, in housing, and, uh, and with that, uh, ended up on the housing committee. Well, based on that, I suddenly became the default, also a default member of the Housing Corporation Board, which actually is not responsible to the Metro Vancouver Board, which is a bit, bit puzzling that you've got this, uh, this organization that could actually be making some major decisions, but never actually has to come back to the larger group of uh, mayors and council in the Metro Vancouver region. And I think this unusual historic cumbersome governance model is part of the issue why Metro Vancouver hasn't been able to raise the, raise the profile as to what it could, uh, it could do on, on housing. And the third and final thing that I wanted to, to talk about uh, shortcoming is, is economic development. Uh, really, there, is, there, there really isn't any regionalism when it comes to economic development in, in Metro Vancouver. Uh, there has been several attempts over the decades to, to try and put things together but in the end, it's everyone for themselves in, uh, in, in the region. And, you know, the city of New Westminster has a small economic development department, and I suspect probably Langley has a, a small economic development department. Uh, Vancouver and Surrey would have much larger ones, and they're all out there competing for the same things, almost competing against each other, where we're trying to convince people, well, New Westminster's the place to do business. You don't want to look at Langley, and, and vice versa. You know, uh, the same is, same is happening when the reality is Metro Vancouver should be competing with, with you know, on the global stage, stage with, uh, with cities all across the world instead of trying to compete with ourselves. And I think this mindset of trying to do this individually and very parochially has, has actually hurt our region in terms of what we could be, uh, what we could achieve economically. So I will leave my rant at, uh, at those three things and, and let uh, Jack jump in. Well, well, thank you very much. Now that you've taken everything I was going to say and added so many more things to it that I could have said, but didn't think of. That was excellent. Thank you very much. I think uh, Jonathan really gave a good overview of, of uh, Metro Vancouver and Transit and some of the issues and some of the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of, of those two systems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, local government role within the regional um, perspective uh, and, and how I've been mayor for four and a half years, my second term. Uh, I wasn't on council prior to being elected mayor, It was, but I have lived in the township of Langley now about 37 years. So, you know, as a lot of uh, elected officials do when they run, people do when they run for office, is they have some great ideas, they love their community, they want to do some good, and they don't. A lot of them are, we're all lay people. We, you know, I didn't go to SFU to take urban studies, I went to SFU and took criminology. So, uh, when it comes to policing issues, yeah, I'm, I can talk to you about that. But when it comes to planning, it's a bit of a learning curve. Yet, you get this group of uh, mayors together uh, and Councillors together uh, who uh, are appointed by their respective councillors, the City of Metro Vancouver uh, Board. And, but collectively, they all bring some wisdom and collectively, they all bring some uh, information that from their perspective, from their community, to the regional board, which is, which is very important. Because at the end of the day, decisions are made and, and they're made collectively. With, um, you know, and, and so from my background, uh, and, you know, I think I'm representative of a lot of. Uh, a lot of people go into elected, off, elected office. Uh, you run for office, you run in your community, you talk about the park next door, and you talk about the roads, not, you know, and, but you don't talk about, a, not a lot of talk is about TransLink. There's a few questions about it. Not a lot of talk about the sewer system or the water system, very important things. And you get elected, now you're thrust onto the board of uh, Mayor's Council of Regional Transportation, TransLink, and Metro Vancouver, and the learning begins because there's a huge region out there. And what's really important is that a lot of work has been done before elected officials get on. And, and, and that work carries on. And uh, as, as Jonathan said, looking at the maps of decisions that were made years ago and how they still are in place today, they've been refined. Of course, things change um, you know, uh, that aren't anticipated way back, but they are still in place and we are moving forward. The uh, uh, board system uh, works well when it comes to major infrastructure. Uh, we see other areas in Canada and North America where amalgamation has taken place. Uh, Metro, or Metro Toronto uh, is a good example of many, uh, several cities and municipalities that came together as one 
And uh, I don't think that's the, the right answer uh, to put everything under one umbrella. There are certain certain things that should remain local, certain things that should be regional. So we, in, a, in effect, we do have a, a regional government uh, in that uh, our major costs are handled, such as uh, water, sewer, uh, air quality, um, uh, and, and uh, solid waste, the, the major big ticket items are handled regionally. And it's important that we have that because as individual municipalities, there's no way we can afford uh, those, those sorts of things, but together, collectively, we can. Uh, but there's a lot of things that still remain local uh, within a regional context, and that's our, our planning. Uh, you know, I, I feel very strongly that um, uh, when, when local planning comes into place, and this is always that difficulty. You have the regional plan where we've all got together and said, this is what we want our region to look like. This is the blueprint, but it's a higher level version. But when it comes down to the local details, uh, that's where you rely on that local government to actually know what the people in their neighborhood are saying, what the people in their, their neighborhood want. So it's a delicate balance that we, that we walk on. And, and whether that's a strength or a weakness, I don't know. I think it's something that we are always working together on in, in ensuring that our local needs are met, our local planning that we're very intimate with, in each local government is met, but yet on a regional scale, we're looking um, at where uh, things should be. And for example, in the township of Langley, uh, in our southern part, uh, we, we call Brooks and Furnish uh, community, uh, right next door, Surrey, uh, city of Surrey is uh, putting a large industrial uh, park in there, in Campbell Heights Park. I look at that as a benefit to us. Uh, we're developing the Brooks and Furnish area. It'll be developed over time, and it's in the urban containment boundary. A lot, you know, with a lot of residential. Well, those people are going to be working in Surrey. So regionally, that's a good thing. I don't look at it as it's, it's something, well, you know, we as local government should have everything in our own little pocket. We can't do that. It has to be regional. So regionally, uh, we have to think regionally, yet I recognize when we're planning the Brooks and Furnish uh, area, that next door to it is this very large industrial complex, which are going to create a lot of jobs and a lot of, a lot of, serv and a lot of services. So you need to have that regional hat in with your local thinking. With um, uh, transportation, uh, Langley doesn't have any rail going through it unless it's carrying coal or containers. We don't have transportation for people, uh, something that we've been working on for many, many years to get. Although uh, working on the Mayor's Council and being at Township of Langley, and you'll hear the same thing from Maple Ridge, you'll hear, uh, you know, we're always concerned that we're at the, either at the end of the line or the beginning of the line, depending on how you look at it. But we're building our communities in anticipation of good transit. Uh, and uh, ha building those communities in anticipation of good transit. And they get built out, and then the residents um, come to us and they can't find parking because there is no tra the transit is in inadequate at that area. Uh, so we built these communities, we followed the plan, and now we're seeing some consequences, unintended consequences, uh, as the plan starts to come to fruition that uh, the, the transit isn't there. So it's, it's uh, so as a local representative, I'm fighting always on the transit board to, to look at the region to ensure that we have a good, strong regional transportation system that includes all of the outlying areas. Uh, however, the money isn't there. It's been spoken and talked about already, failed referendum. Um, you know, one of the things I saw when I first got on the transit board is how do, we, how do we move forward when we have no uh, sustainable funding mechanism for the growth that's going to happen in the area and those discussions have happened and, and uh, there's they're continuing to happen but the referendum was was quite an exclamation point at the end of uh, some a lot of hard work that uh, we, we just weren't going to find that funding that easily so uh, so in Langley there's a lot of uh, struggles a lot of uh, and many municipalities find that and I think you can talk to any mayor in any municipality and they're all going to say you know we're unique we need more but when we do get together and we put the regional hat on and you look at the entire region, we have to work together. One of the weaknesses, um, I think, in the metro governance system is the weighted vote. Uh, it's very difficult for uh, the township of Langley has six votes. Uh, I think the city of Langley has two votes. Uh, there's, what, 150 votes, or give or take, on the Metro Vancouver board. You have to work together, but several, because the voting system is based on population, uh, some of the needs of the smaller communities um, may not be met, or they may feel that they're not being met because of the a weighted vote system. So there's a good reasons for it because it represents population. However, when you look at the entire region, maybe there could be a better uh, structure in, in making decisions, important decisions that, that affect the region. The, um, uh, some of the other uh, areas that we talk about, um, the uh, Metro Vancouver, 
uh, TransLink, yet we're dovetailed into a lot of other regulatory schemes. Uh, in Langley, we're 75% of the agriculture is agricultural land reserve. Surrey has a lot of agricultural land. Uh, Maple Ridge has a lot of agricultural land, Pitt Meadows, uh, and on down the line. And so now you add another level with the Agricultural Land Commission, and you add a level with uh, Metro Vancouver, and it, it becomes even more difficult in regional governance. So all of these play an important part, and without getting into too much detail, it's 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 uh, makes it very complicated, yet somehow we have to work together. When it comes to, I know what Jonathan mentioned housing, he did a great, much better job than I did. We don't have any Metro Vancouver housing in the township of Langley, yet uh, uh, as, as we all know, we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of growth in Township of Langley, and, and uh, uh, up till up to the last couple of months, I thought we had a lot of affordable housing in the Township of Langley, but uh, even that's been going up considerably. So, uh, the housing market uh, is is uh, a difficult one. Uh, our we are kind of, I suppose, if you looked at the region, the Township of Langley has probably the least amount percentage-wise of rental housing, and that's starting to change. But that's something that we need to work further on. And with Metro Vancouver, as John was saying, there hasn't been a lot of growth. Uh, in, in the housing, and uh, it's something that maybe we should be looking at is putting it more region-wide. Uh, so just, I, th I think it's best to open up to questions, um, like, uh, leave it up to you, because you know we've kind of laid it out. There's, there's really a lot of strengths in governance uh, in a, in a um, region-wide, but also it's important that we retain that local uh, feel for local issues. Yeah, a lot of good issues raised, so let's open it up. Oh, that's great. I might just add, um, it's, uh, oh, I'll, I'll let the question come up first. Then. Uh, you go ahead. Um, so we've been having a discussion over at our table as the day has, has gone on because the relationship between the region and the province has come up a number of times. And uh, just this morning in CBC, there was an article uh, with the title, Christy Clark shrugs off urban roots for rural crowds. Christy Clark plays up parties' rural values in expense of urban BC. And I'm just wondering, do you find it problematic, the schism that's being created between rural BC and BC's economy as the provincial government has casted it and, and our region? And I'm wondering if you had to convey to Christy Clark or this provincial government why our region matters in a provincial context, what, what are some of the stronger arguments you can make as to why these things should not be separated out but our health and the health of rural BC perhaps should be seen as intertwined? Give an opinion. It's a, it's a good you know, one. I, I, I think back when uh, Joy was speaking, and I, I look forward to being up on, on a panel as a, you know, at the end of my political career when I don't have to be quite as diplomatic as I, I might have to be now. But, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it is pretty fair to say that, uh, you know, certainly the, the current provincial government uh, has a lot more of a focus on kind of the rural, suburban British Columbia and is not as much passion for, for urban urban issues, uh, and in particular Metro Vancouver, um, it's, it's a challenging situation because, uh, uh, you know, I often think that, you know, maybe it would have been good if, uh, if, if uh, our premier had been elected in Vancouver and potentially been a little bit more immersed in kind of some Vancouver, Vancouver issues. Um, and it's, it, it certainly has led to a cleavage uh, between, uh, between what uh, the regionals mayors have, have been doing and, and the province, and there seems to be Two different visions coming forward. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful, uh, you know, even just out of pure politics, given how many seats that the Metro Vancouver region has, that I can't imagine how any provincial government can just ignore the Metro Vancouver region and not acknowledge how important it is, even just from a, a pure politic getting elected standpoint. Uh, um, but you know, I think in until the Metro Vancouver actually region starts to realize that they're not the priority of the provincial government and starts to put some, some heat on the provincial government, uh, I'm not necessarily sure you're going to see a major, major shift there. If, uh, if the, the path to victory is still through suburban and rural British Columbia, um, you know, that is not, not necessarily a, a hopeful future for, for the Metro Vancouver region. All I can say is that, you know, those would be her points of view. Um, the Metro Vancouver Metro Vancouver region is a huge economic driver in the province of British Columbia, and there's and so is the rural. And, and you know, I guess Langley is a good, good example of that. We're urban and rural, and and but but when I never did hear that comment, so I can't 
you know, you, you mentioned, so I can't really comment too much on it, but I do know that uh, uh, the rural areas of British Columbia have a lot different needs than Metro Vancouver does. There, there, there are different needs. The smaller communities, they have pressures that, uh, that we don't have. When I sit down, actually tomorrow I'm going to uh, Fort St. John to, to uh, Mayor's Caucus and sitting down with mayors of communities of 400 people and uh, sitting down with mayors of large communities and very, very different issues that they have, very different. And so I think it's okay for the, the Premier to focus on that, but you cannot forget the large economic driver where the jobs are in the Metro Vancouver region. What happens in a rural area up north, the oil and gas industry trickles right down to every one of our municipalities. And uh, so the two are intertwined and you can't separate the two. We're, we're very closely linked to, um, to the north, very closely linked to uh, rural areas. But uh, there are some challenges that rural areas have that are certainly different than ours, but uh, we all face challenges, and uh, I don't think one should be separated from the other. Uh, Lisa Spitali, I'm the CEO of the City of Newsminster. Um, undergrad in political science, master's degree in planning. Peter Overlander was one of my profs. I think this is amazing. So my question has more to do with trying to reflect on what Zach was saying about legitimacy, with what Gordon Price was talking about with the challenges of the region, my own biases with the Metro Vancouver. And I think, I think part of the conflict that we're trying to deal with is Metro Vancouver, I think, works well from a non-political service delivery model, sewers, et cetera, where I think it's struggling, I'm not going to say failing because that's a value statement, but struggling is around the issues of public policy and issues that are discretionary in nature, which is the essence of public policy. So land use planning, transportation, two to come to mind. How do we reconcile a conversation around some of the inequities in the region with a non-democratic system, people aren't elected into the GVRD, and how we have sort of challenges with a vote distribution where two, three cities can block. Is part of the solution here looking at some sort of a elected system for Metro Vancouver so that we can actually address the political issues that we're struggling with right now? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a really interesting question because I, I think you can really highlight the areas where I stated at the beginning where I thought Metro Vancouver was doing very well and we were not doing well. And, uh, you know, the reality is the, the areas that we're doing well is those core functions that aren't that political. The, you know, I, I'm trying to think the last time Metro Vancouver had a big fight about uh, a sewer main. It's, those aren't the types of things that are, get much attention or any coverage or, 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 or need to, for that matter. But when you bring up kind of those hot political potatoes like transportation, public transit, affordable housing, uh, and I, I, I wouldn't use the word discretionary when I describe those things, but I would say they, they, are, they do fall into to a different category. So, um, you know, I think it's a good point in that those areas don't seem to have, uh, you know, a direct political, political master that is directly accountable to, to the public, whether we're talking about the existing uh, TransLink governance structure or even Metro Vancouver, which is kind of an indirectly elected uh, body, how they could maybe even tackle some of these issues. Um, the challenges, though, is I think all of those issues are better served to be handled regionally than individually in a municipality. I, know I think of, you know, I, I gave the example of economic development, but, but even from a housing perspective, the city of New Westminster is just too small to be setting up our own housing corporation and running and operating that. Having said that, uh, you know, I think we want to but put us together with a lot of other uh, like-minded and, and similar municipalities that have the same goals, and then we finally do have the resources and we're of the scalability to actually make something work to benefit that. So um, I, I know I didn't answer your question because I don't think I have an answer, but I think that's part of the conundrum we have here is, you know, the basic issues that people don't get excited about are perfectly fine under our current uh, governance structures and, and regionalism, but those issues that tend to be the ones that uh, get everyone uh, excited about are the areas that we just haven't found the right right mix. So I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but um, I think that's an interesting point. My perspective on, on that is that uh, it's, the Metro Vancouver board is appointed by the various councils. And as I said earlier, I think some of the issues are better um, local, uh, 
when it comes to planning and you know what the neighbors want, you know what they want in their area, you have, and still working within the regional vision. So it's, it's a regional perspective, but local thinking. And I think the region works great in the core services, and that's where it should stay. Uh, what, one thing I'm always concerned about is where we start creeping into provincial responsibilities. Housing is a provincial responsibility. Certainly, uh, the, the uh, issues uh, land on our doorsteps as municipalities, but we cannot stop uh, reminding uh, the levels of government where the responsibilities lie. And I, I was, have some difficulty in, in just because they're not, other levels of government are not taking their responsibilities that we're not all of a sudden going to take it on. It has to be pushed back, it has to be pushed back so that uh, a job is being done by them. So uh, somehow Metro Vancouver got involved in housing. I think it's great. It's, they're running it, uh, it's not a cost to the taxpayers, it basically pays itself. And, and for some reason, they got into housing. Uh, in certain areas it works. I mentioned uh, we don't have any of their housing in, in Langley. Uh, they're also involved in parks. Now is parks a role that Metro Vancouver should be in? And some say they would be because there's areas of land that serve a regional purpose that should be protected. And uh, the uh, regional government is, is uh, as, merit, as uh, municipalities want to work collectively together, that's one area where we can uh, take large parcels of land and, uh, and manage them as parks regionally. And because, uh, you know, we each, each municipality has some Metro Vancouver parks, at least I believe they do. We've got quite a, quite a good proportion of our parkland is Metro Vancouver Park in Langley, but it's a regional thing. But do we really need to be there? That's, that's always a question. But when it comes to, to the main services, definitely it, the system works great. But if we start creeping into other areas where um, perhaps it should stay with local government and stay with provincial government, uh, we may be getting into areas that do we really belong there. So I, I think I'll, I'll respond to that because I think in, in many respects I can agree with, with some of that sentiment, but in other respects I could have some disagreements. Uh, you know, I think from a, a taxation power, uh, there, there has got to be uh, a recognition of the limitations of, of local government to, to take on some of, the, some of these, these challenges. Uh, you know, with the limited taxation power, which is mainly property taxes, uh, we're just not able to, to really fully, like I can't sit here and say I can solve the affordable housing crisis with the, the powers mandated in our municipality or even our, our regional government. Um, having said that, where I will disagree with, uh, with my colleague is, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we, uh, I don't think we should limit ourselves to, uh, you know, the constitutional frameworks of, uh, of our, our different levels of government and those things shall never evolve for the rest of time. Uh, you know, I think there's got to be a recognition that, um, you know, issues like affordable housing have a direct impact on, on local governments, and there's a lot more passion to actually deal with those issues on the local level uh, compared to potentially other levels of government. And, um, you know, I, I, I recognize our, our limits in terms of being able to fund and, and truly do that, but, uh, you know, simply passing it off because, uh, you know, 150 five uh, years ago plus, uh, it was decided these, these are the different roles of the government. Uh, uh, to me, I, I, I don't think that's, that's good enough uh, when we're dealing with something right now, it's a real issue. Well, it's, I, I agree with you, I don't, don't disagree. It's just, <laughs> we, don't have the, we don't have the taxation tools to do what isn't their mandate. If that was to change, I'll go for it, but at this point it isn't, and we end up taking taxpayers' dollars through property uh, tax and putting it to areas where the funding should be in place, and you know, I think we're great. Ad I think municipalities are great advocates, and work collaboratively together to advocate for the necessary um, uh, services and that we need in our community, whether it be housing, whether it be homelessness issue, whether it be hospitals, whether it be, you know, I don't build hospitals, but I certainly work with Fraser Health to ensure that a hospital. So it's important that we're advocates, but until that framework is changed, um, it needs to land where it belongs, and uh, certainly work together on, on finding solutions. Question about the people who work for you, um, uh, staff. Most of our students are not going to become elected officials. Most of our students are going to end up working um, in municipal government. What are the attributes um, of staff in municipal government that you're looking for that um, that really uh, that help in regional governance questions? And how can we think about what the um, the competencies and the expertise that um, they need to bring to those professional roles that are going to make your job easier in, at the regional scale. <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll start that one off uh, on good question on, on staff and from a, from a mayor's perspective and, and a council's perspective, perspective what you want to see. And I, 
and I can only speak for myself, I think each mayor has their own perspective and, and each council is a little bit different and, and uh, staff are, are there to uh, provide uh, the technical uh, and the professional advice to council. And as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're elected, we're not experts on, on a lot of the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, but the day after you get elected, you're now an expert. That's what I found out. You have the answers for everything, apparently. But we rely on that expertise. And so, uh, but the one thing I like to see in staff is, is, um, is not just, okay, this is the policy, this is the bylaw, we're gonna follow it to the nth degree. Uh, but somebody, but life isn't like that. We get, we get uh, residents come to the, count, the front counter with, with um, challenges, with uh, ideas, with things that maybe we haven't thought of, with new ways of doing things, with new ways of building that we aren't accommodated in our, in our bylaws, perhaps, or in our policies. And what I like to see uh, staff do is start to think outside the box, not to deviate from the policies, but to say, okay, there's, let's take a look at this. How can we make this work with, in the framework that we have? And if it's not within the framework that we have, how do we present it to council so that, there, so that council can make a decision uh, and uh, to change that policy if there's something you know, worthwhile coming that would come through? Uh, and, and I see that all the time. Um, you know, it, nothing fits in the boxes. We, I've got businesses. For example, I've got a business right now that just had a, a tragic fire. Uh, they've lost uh, a building, they have to replace the building. But in Langley, things have been going on for many, many years that kind of fell through the cracks. They're, it's a strange thing. They've got a, a manufacturing zone on, in the agricultural land reserve. Go figure how that happened years ago. But now they're kind of in non-compliance. Nobody really cared until they're fired and they have to get a building permit. So now we're in a position where we have to see how do we resolve this um, business, long-standing business, in something that just happened over many, many, many years. And, uh, and I appreciate when staff come and say, okay, we've got an issue, and what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this thing work? Uh, we have to, he has to come into compliance, but uh, it's not just saying, no, it can't happen. Uh, that's what I look for in staff. I think people are going to, you know, the students that are coming through, they're gonna learn the technical trade, they're gonna learn uh, you know, the policy, they're gonna learn how to write reports, but it's a little bit more than that. You have to be able to learn how to look past the, you know, what the rules are and say, is there a way we can help? but stay still within our legal framework. And council may have to uh, be educated to make some changes. So I, I think some of the, the skills that, uh, you know, I think are, are, are critically important uh, that they'd be looking for, you know, really is all along the lines of, of, of being able to work in, work in a team and work between departments. Uh, you know, I think more so than, than in the past, uh, you know, cities are recognizing they can't continue to operate in silos. And I think, uh, you know, any, any individual that's able to come forward and demonstrate that, you know, whether they're working in the planning department or the engineering department or parks and recreation, to, to be able to apply their skills to, to, to broadly be able to connect with, with different departments and be able to, to have those types of collaboration skills, I think, you know, in terms of those are the types of things that, uh, you know, I think uh, when I, I think of the rising stars at the city of New Westminster, it's the staff members that have been able to uh, to exhibit uh, those those types of uh, those types of qualities. Hello, I'm, I'm Beverly Grieve, and I'm the director of development services for the city of New Westminster. I was also a student of Jim Wilson, which is great, and he really, really is a reason why I went into planning. So I, you know, certainly acknowledge the memory of him. Uh, in 2011, um, Chris DeMarco and Eric and I sat around a table for many, many, many hours and days, and there, probably beer was involved, and um, we were working on the regional growth strategy. And the key question that we dealt with is what are issues of regional significance and what are issues of local significance? And we would go through every policy in that document and, and ask ourselves, is this an issue of regional significance and why? And what I'd like to know is from the political perspective, what do you see as the biggest criteria that would help you decide of, of, of something that is of regional importance and should be dealt with, or something that's of local importance? Do you want me to take it you first? Take, you can take this out, yeah. Okay. Good question. Uh, so, you always say good question. You always preface your comments with good question because you don't know what the answer is, and then everybody <laughs> says, wow. My opinion and, and uh, would be that you start, and, and it's, it's a great question because you're gonna have stuff that is black and white regional and you're gonna have stuff that is black and white local and then everything else in between. So you, I, I can see you struggled with that. Uh, when it comes to, to pipes and uh, you know, that's, to me that's a no brainer. We have to share those, those um, 
services with each other. We can't afford to do it alone, and our strength is working together. Uh, so when it comes to solid waste and it, and it comes to uh, uh, you know, the sewers and the drainage, uh, definitely. And as I mentioned, okay, do parks fall into that? Do, does housing fall into that? Is that becoming more social? Does trans, you know, the transportation issues? Uh, planning, and planning is something that uh, certainly Township Lining had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, experience with, uh, with Metro Vancouver. And um, the, the local aspect of planning, yet you still have to have that regional vision of where things should go. So uh, it gets very gray, and I don't know if there's a real good answer because you'll, we have 21 municipalities, one electoral area, and one First Nations on the Metro boards. So there's 23 people, and you probably have 23, or 23 municipalities, 23 different answers for it. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, and I can see you it was a, it's a big challenge to go through that. But uh, the obvious ones are the services, the, the main services that we have to share because of sheer cost and working together. And some of the other ones, uh, they get down to, do we need to share parks? I think it's, a, I think it's great, I love it, but do we need to do that as a regional thing? Should, be, that, should that be at the municipal level? So, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, so I, I don't think there's necessarily a, a right or wrong answer to that question. I think uh, you know, even Jack and I probably have different opinions as to you know, when it comes to land use controls, the role that, that Metro Vancouver should, should play. Uh, you know, I would probably be on the spectrum, far end of the spectrum and in the region in terms of actually saying that, that, that those controls should be stronger and uh, should have more of an influence. Um, but there are many other and perspectives across the region and mayors with different perspectives that would have very good reasons to, to argue the opposite. Uh, I think where we've found our success in the region, though, is we've been able to find that, that, that line in the sand that has actually been able to essentially negotiated our way to that path where we've been able to find consensus uh, through our, our successful regional land use plans over the many decades in this region to, to say, okay, this is, this is where, uh, where those differences will be. So, you know, I don't think it's, uh, you know, we'll all have different opinions as to where that authority lies, but ultimately when you've got, uh, you know, 23 local governments working together, it's that the correct line is the line where you got those 23 governments willing to agree to that. And that's the only way it could work. I'd like to uh, explore that idea of, of the um, election of the Metro Vancouver Board. Um, you know, I, I love the, the, the reference, the, the talk from Professor Taylor about the input legitimacy. And mm -hmm. I think that's an important point. And I understand why it's important that uh, the Metro Vancouver Board be made up of council councillors and mayors. I'm wondering if there would be an opportunity or some sort of a mechanism for the the uh, voters to choose who the representative of of council would be to them to represent them on Metro Vancouver board. If there was some sort of mechanism to, to allow that, would you be in favor of that or, or is there a reason why you don't think it would work? So whether to you know, elect, elect to, the, to the board, now the question would be is Metro Vancouver a level of government uh, or is it a, that, and that's the big question. I believe it's right now we have to Depends of if you want to call them levels or orders of government, the federal, provincial, and local government. Regional districts are part of local government, and we appoint people to that. So uh, our our you know the, our residents vote and elect their elected officials, and the elected officials then appoint to the board because the board you know, really mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what we may disagree is really a service delivery model with uh, and what we've agreed that there are some other issues that we need to address regionally. So whether you set it up where it's going to be elected, you're going to have actually you're you're putting in place another a fourth level of government, uh, and uh, because it, it would then have um, yeah, its local representation, uh, whether it's going to have its taxation powers and everything else to go with it, I don't know. But the model that we have now, although not perfect, uh, I think works. It uh, represents the the region. Talk, you know, we could tweak up some of the the uh, the weighted vote issue. That's of course because when, when I'm on the other end of the of it, where we have a few votes, but I'm not sure if uh, if uh, electing directly to that board is something that we'd want to see, it. and uh, you know, that's just my opinion. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to think of specifically the model you were trying to describe, where through the local elections you also choose of the successful candidates which one of the mayor or council would uh, would end up serving on the Metro Vancouver board. Uh, you know, I think the reality of what would happen in that situation, it would be the most high-profile person, which would be the most, uh, most likely would be the successful mayoral candidate, which is actually what happens right now for the most part is the mayors uh, are the representatives on there. So I can't see that 
that kind of a model actually leading to too big of a difference of the composition of, of the Metro Vancouver board as it, uh, as it exists. Thinking, taking that concept, should the Metro Vancouver board actually be directly elected and be a separate election? I, I think it's certainly a very interesting topic, uh, uh, but back to my opening remarks, it, it'd be, well, what is, what is the goal of that? Because I think of how Metro Vancouver currently operates a lot of its core functions, and I cannot see those functions being operated uh, you know, any better through a, through a different electoral system. Now, if you want to talk about TransLink or you want to talk about housing, well, then maybe there is a, a more interesting discussion about having some kind of system that, uh, that, uh, that had something a little bit more directly accountable to the public and directly, uh, directly uh, elected. So um, there I would see, yeah, potentially the opportunity to have that conversation. But I think you have to be very clear why you would want that governance change, because I think governance change, just for the sake of governance change, is not a good reason to, to go down that road. Can I just jump in with a question of my own here? Um, as you might have noticed the last couple of years, there's been a, a slight uptick in um, property values. And I'm curious about um, what kind of impact that's going to have on the dynamics of land use politics uh, at the regional level uh, and how that will evolve uh, moving forward. The uh, yeah, land values and politics. There are those that say um, we should be doing something about it, and I think as soon as, as soon as government, my philosophy, as soon as government gets involved in, in, in that kind of thing, we make it worse. We, we tend to mess it up rather than, than do anything about it. Our land use policy, we, we do have a land use policy in the region in, in that we've de designated where the industrial lands will be, the residential lands will be, the agricultural lands will be. And the problem is we only have so much land. And over time, um, in my, my memory of, of uh, living in the Fraser Valley, of seeing these uh, land values go up, uh, Incredibly high people to the point and then interest rates, uh, you know back in the early um, Early 80s uh, went so high that people were losing their homes and their houses were half the value uh, And the market corrected itself with interest rates. What's going to correct itself today? I don't know but as soon as we get involved uh, It's I really don't see a, a proper way of doing it One thing I've heard is that development and growth is too fast. So then I said okay So then we're gonna start slowing down development. We're gonna start saying okay. We're not gonna develop as fast, then what you've done is put more pressure on housing and put the prices up faster. Uh, you know, the problem is there's just not enough land in this beautiful part of the world. Uh, there's lots of other parts of British Columbia where you can get a piece of land and buy a house that is still reasonable, but people want to live here. Uh, so politics and land values, um, I'm of the opinion that politics and land values, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. I don't know the answer. I think the market will, will take will find its way to level out. And because uh, I went through it in the early 80s when I bought my first property, my wife and I bought a, bought a small farm. Uh, and, you know, our payments went up $1,000 a month on a business that had less than $100,000 a year income. We saw those real hard times that people are losing their homes. Yet it leveled out and today you don't go think back, boy, those houses are expensive. Uh, in today's value, they aren't. Somehow it levels out. But for us to get involved and put politics into this mix, I don't know. The politics that we have already is our land use designations, and we've decided where the urban growth will be. And uh, to to shrink it would be worse. To enlarge it, we're impacting other lands, industrial lands or agricultural lands that we're looking to protect. So I'm going to take a, a little bit different uh, different tact. Uh, you know, I I look at the amount of land that we have in the region, and if we want to remain committed to protecting our natural spaces and protecting our agricultural land. You know, I think at, at some point we've got to acknowledge that the region has run out of space to continue with the pre-existing model of the single family, single family neighborhood being the main, you know, driver for, for housing growth in the region. The reality is without, uh, with, with the exception of a few small areas that can see some growth in single family neighborhoods, uh, there's just no room left in the region for that. And we've always contemplated that, but we've now actually hit to that point where, no, we are, you know, We've got to reevaluate. You know, not everyone is going to be able to uh, to be able to own the the one acre lot uh, single family home, and I think as part of been our discussion for the last thirty years is that was probably never should have been our ideal in, in the first place. There, uh, you know, I myself I've got three children and I live in a multifamily unit, and uh, you know even my wife and I have have good jobs, but the reality is we don't really see ourselves in a single family home, and I think. Where we, where we start to address you know, some of the challenges we face, instead of trying to say, how do we solve the expectations from the past generation, is to say, 
how can we actually start to, to build our densifying and more urban nature of Metro Vancouver to meet the needs of, of, of younger families and young people growing up. So how do we make our urban environments so that they are, are friendly places to actually raise, uh, raise children? How do, we, how do we make sure the amenities are in place? Uh, how do you make sure that when you're actually building multifamily units that they're not all just studio or one bedroom apartments? And uh, you know, these are issues we've been grappling at, here at, uh, at the city of New Westminster. And uh, you know, being the oldest city in the region, I often find that we run into problems before everyone else does, and have started to have to have to grapple with them. Uh, but I think we've been, you know, there, there's not going to be any single family expansion in the single city of New Westminster. But our city continues to grow, and there continues to be more children living living in the city. And I think we've been able to to accomplish that by making sure that our urban environments are also places that uh, that people of all demographics uh, can can find the right housing option. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Jonathan, I was really interested in your story about getting appointed to the Metro Vancouver Housing Board. I work with not-for-profits throughout BC and oftentimes the way people end up on not-for-profit boards is pretty informal, so it was interesting to see your Metro Vancouver not necessarily much more formal, so that was interesting. Um, I want to pick up on this notion of regional significant um, issues. We heard the example this morning from David, a rare instance of local politicians running on platforms or in their campaigns making a reference to regional issues. And you know, you mentioned that was very a, a rare instance, maybe the only instance in the United States. Under the current structure, do either of you foresee any set of circumstances or any possible way either of you in you know, municipal elections in 2018 would be running on platforms of explicitly regional issues, saying, you know, maybe it's a platform of cities in a sea of green or advocating and are campaigning for one of the five goals in the regional growth strategy like to me there's currently not an incentive to do is there any any circumstance under which you would have a there would be an interest for either of you to run an explicit campaign of here's my platform it's the region is there any way that would happen uh, right no now? <laughs> no <laughs> no I'll, I'll be no just a quick answer but it, it's you, I mentioned that earlier about uh, when when I you know run for office it's about where you live in your mm -hmm. neighborhood. And um, I find even in Langley, we went through our entire um, regional, uh, our, our official community plan for the entire township of Langley was uh, renewed about three, four years ago. Uh, I don't think anybody showed up at the public hearing because it's about it's such a big picture item. It doesn't affect them out the front door. But when we start talking about neighborhood plan, that's gonna affect the street in front of themselves, in front of their door or the park down the street uh, or a high rise or a townhouse coming out next door, our public hearings are full. People, the residents really are focused on what affects them daily and, and I don't think we grasp how important that the region is. And as, as elected officials when you're, when you're running or, or also as residents and how that affects your day to day. Uh, all politics is local. Tip O'Neill has a book on that. It's called All Politics is Local. And most people running for office are gonna focus on the issues that their residents are talking to them about and discuss that. Uh, certainly transportation comes up, and that's a regional issue. That comes up a lot in my community. But uh, sewer doesn't come up. Uh, water doesn't come up. Uh, collaborating with Metro Vancouver, or you can be a good Metro Vancouver board director, doesn't come up. So when you get right down to it, when you're running a, a campaign to get elected, you're gonna speak to the people and what they wanna hear and where your views are and things that are of interest to them. Unfortunately, I don't think people have that much interest in Metro Vancouver issues. Uh, they may have some issues on transportation. Why don't we have a bus coming down our street? But it really, all politics is local. I mean, we get right down to it. Politicians run on local issues. Yeah, so not, not to be too repetitive, but a, a similar answer. Uh, you know, I think when most people do run uh, in, in any election, they, they generally are running because they'd like to win. And I think if you were to run in a local election and completely ignore local issues, uh, I think you would do that at, at, at your peril. Uh, you know, I can imagine you know, knocking on someone's door during an election campaign and then wanting to talk about the local park in their neighborhood and me saying, well, no, I, I don't have anything to say about that, but let me talk to you about the Metro Vancouver Water District. Uh, mm -hmm. That wouldn't go over, over too well. Um, having said that, I think there is probably an opportunity more so to actually talk about regional issues in, in local elections. Uh, I remember in 2014 campaign, there was, you know, the ref the upcoming referendum was was a hot topic, and uh, you know, a big part of what I was putting out in my literature and what I was talking about were regional transportation issues. So I think uh, I think there 
I think what currently exists is regional issues do get discussed, but I think there is probably an opportunity for, for them to just discuss more so in conjunction with, with local issues. If we have a referendum on the water pipe, then that will be coming. This will be the last question. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor Cote, thank you for bringing up economic development. I think it gets missed a lot at a regional level, and we do need to sell ourselves as Vancouver the region or um, to the outside world. Does this, how, how does the region, how does Metro Vancouver as a regional district get involved in this? Is there some kind of industrial land database that's regional that we, you know, uh, that obviously, if it seems to me industrial lands comes up for me today a lot as far as how this is connected. I think about Salt Spring uh, coffee ending up in Richmond and Vancouver being devastated and Microsoft expanding in Vancouver instead of in Richmond. So how, how do we make this work and what should we do to move forward? Yeah, well, I, I think right now economic development doesn't really have a home in, in, in Metro Vancouver. Uh, uh, issues like industrial land are, are things that are definitely talked about, particularly under the planning side, but it's it's generally under a, a planning guise at, at the Metro Vancouver who's done lots of studies about industrial land, but it never takes it to that, that next level as a coordinated approach. And, you know, right now I, I think probably the first step would be actually testing, uh, you know, testing the political will of, of the region, whether we wanted to actually coordinate on, on that. Uh, I, I, I talked earlier about, uh, you know, what's happened in, in Denver, and that came out of uh, a regional prosperity forum that happened just this past week, uh, put on by Metro Vancouver, and, and Greg Moore was, was, was hosting that, essentially was to try and launch this, uh, this discussion in the region um, to, to kind of say, looking at an example of Denver, which had many municipalities just like uh, Metro Vancouver, was completely discoordinated and was one of the lowest performing economic, uh, in terms of economics in, in the United States, and how they have completely turned that around. And it has essentially been about, you know, thinking of the bigger Metro Denver as opposed to themselves. And, and that in itself has been the key driver, in their opinion, and is, is how they've been able to to turn themselves around. So I think it's it's an interesting discussion that uh, I expect that uh, uh, you know our chair Greg Moore will probably be advancing at uh, you know at the board level to take the regional prosperity forum to to that next level. What that looks like or what the political appetite to uh, to kind of get into areas where individual municipalities are all doing their own thing uh, could be a challenging discussion. But in my opinion, it's one worth having. I think you nailed it. I forgot to mention um, that Chief Bryce Williams uh, obviously couldn't make it. That's something unexpected came up, so I'm sure that's that's unfortunate. Um, so yeah, just uh, thank you both to Jack and to uh, Jonathan for your excellent talk. We now have a 15-minute break. <laughs>